thank you very much everybody for coming people that came here in person and those that are joining us online uh, my name is Philippe Moriel I'm an associate professor here at the Ranch Cattle Research and Education Center so a little bit about the program this year we're going to have our fourth annual nutrition for beef females usually we do this type of meeting in three counties and we usually have a live demonstration at the end but obviously the uh, the past few years has been kind of crazy so we have to do the just this format of presentations right but this year i would also like to thank all the sponsors okay arm and hammer vigor tone organic matters purina mcnass walpole feed and supply all tech and zoetis for all their support okay without their support we wouldn't be able to do this program for free have lunch for everybody and also be able to bring the the two speakers i am going to introduce them before each of their presentation but those two guys they are probably the, the stars of the animal science department, Texas A&M. Uh, very old friends, uh, like them a lot, and they're highly recognized nationally, internationally. So you guys, you can skip my talk if you want to and just pay attention to theirs. Right? So this year we, got, we decided to focus on pre-calving supplementation, okay? Uh, because we're trying to change the perspective of people, right? That nutrition before calving is not just for the count. Is something that we can take advantage of, all right? And at the end, we're gonna have Dr. Poehler talking about pregnancy loss in beef cattle. He's an expert on that, and then we can have a lot of discussions. So it's gonna be very informal, okay? Uh, maybe we we'll, can do a couple questions at the end of every uh, of each presentation. At the end of each of those three presentations, we're gonna have uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Half Proles share about his uh, operation and his point of view about these topics that we, we we're gonna cover. And then after that, we're gonna have an open session for questions. So if you do not have a chance to make a question right after the, the presentation, you're gonna have time at the end, okay? Right before lunch, all right? So please feel free to participate, interact. Those of you joining online, you can enter your question in the chat box, all right? So uh, for my part, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus only on protein and energy supplementation. And after my presentation, Reynaldo will talk about fat and trace minerals, okay? So what I want to do in my presentation is, like I said, give an introduction about this change of perspective, right? Stop thinking about pre calving nutrition as just as a means to ensure good condition score of a cow, but also as a strategy to improve long-term performance of the offspring. So I'm gonna show a lot of the studies that we have been doing here in Florida since 2016 with timing, okay, when should we supplement, frequency, what type of feed additive can we include, and looking at the pre-weaning performance of the calves, immune function, carcass quality, and also the impact on heifer performance, okay? So just to begin with, these, you guys know this for a long time, right? This is just a table showing you the pregnancy rates of animals if they're calving low, high, uh, or, I mean, high, moderate, or low body condition score, okay? And then what happens to their conception rates to AI after calving if they maintain, gain, or lose body condition score? Right. And then obviously you guys can see that those cows that calve in good condition, they will have better conception rates to AI compared to those that are calving thin. But those ones that are look at this, the last row here, the ones that are calving in low body condition score. Even if you make them gain condition after calving, right, their conception rate is going to get better, but it will never fully compensate for the fact that that cow calved thin. All right. So Pre-calving supplementation for years has been this strategy just to make sure that they will calve in a body condition score five or above. Now, but recently we're changing that, right? And you guys probably heard somewhere or heard me talking about this, the fetal programming, is the idea that by changing the nutrition of those animals during pregnancy, you can affect how those organs develop, how the tissues develop, and that's gonna set how they're gonna perform in the future. All right, so just to give you an idea, right? And the two point of view, the two main messages of this slide is the following. When every time, every tissue in the body has different priority for nutrients. And the ones that have the lowest priority is muscle and adipose tissue. So when you have an energy restriction during gestation, the first two tissues that will be damaged is muscle and adipose tissue, unfortunately, right? Now, the other message is every single tissue has a different timeline of development. So visceral organs, they form primarily during the first three months of gestation. Muscle tissue, they start forming during the second trimester and late gestation. And adipose tissue, the one responsible for marbling, will form primarily during late gestation. 
So depending on when you change the nutrition, the outcome to the calf is going to be totally different, which is actually a good thing, right? Because you can actually take advantage of that. And depending on what you, what's your goal, what you want to improve, you can use different timing of supplementation. All right. That's the main idea in here. So when you look at all this, don't worry about reading every single one, okay, all right? The, the point I want to show here in this slide is there are about 37 studies that look into pre-carrying supplementation of protein and energy and what's the impact on the calf. The ones that are highlighted in green are the studies that showed a positive outcome to the birth weights, pre-weaning growth or post-weaning growth, okay? So what you guys can see is that in average, about a little over half of them show a positive outcome to pre-carrying supplementation. Okay, and we can discuss later about why we don't have that much consistency. But the point that I want to make is that a lot of them report a positive response. Unfortunately, very few studies continue evaluating the performance of the calves for a long time. And that's something that we're trying to do here in Florida and also on Reynaldo's studies. We follow them all the way to carcass, uh, carcass quality and, and heifer development. All right. So, but the point that I want to make here also is that 95% of those studies they were done in Midwest or West United States with ball stars animals, right? So the first thing that I did when I came back to Florida in 2016 was to run this type of studies to see if in our situation here in Florida with our weather conditions, with bosinicus influence, with grass, uh, tropical grasses, do we also report the same type of response as other people are reporting in other areas of the United States? Can we use that here in Florida to enhance the performance of the animals. So the first study is quite simple. It's the first one we ever began here in Florida. So we were looking at pre calving supplementation. So we had three treatments, okay, very simple. The first one doesn't provide any supplementation before calving, which is what most people do, right? We have plenty of grass during that time. Now, the second treatment is we provided roughly two pounds of distiller's grains for about 84 days before calving. And then we decided, you know, we recognize this is a long time to supplement. Not a lot of people have time or the conditions to feed those animals for such a long time. So what we did, we incorporated a third treatment, trying to be more cost effective. So instead of providing two pounds for 84 days, I provided four for half of the time, right? And we focused on the first half of that late gestation period. So that figure that I'm showing you at the top is just the energy requirements of those counts. And you can see the last three months that it increases exponentially. During the first half of that last three months, their requirements are still low. So what we did, we concentrated all the supplement during that time. And the idea would be, okay, with the same amount of supplement, I'm going to put more condition on those cows. And at the same time, I'm reducing labor by half. But then the idea is what's going to be the trade-off? What's going to be the impact on the calf, right? And I'm, I'm thinking only on the cow, but what's going to be the consequence to the calf? And then after calving, everybody's treated exactly the same. Everybody gets molasses with urea on, on liquid tanks and same types of pasture all the way to weaning, all right? So what happened to body condition score of, count, of those cows? Uh, we started studying in August, about two to three weeks after we weaned their calves. And then those cows start calving in November, all right? So you guys can see that the blue line is the control group. They start losing condition about 45 days towards the end of their late gestation period. And that happens in every single study that I'm going to show you right now. So even though we had plenty of grass, at that time, the amount of energy and protein is already not enough to sustain body condition score of those animals. So we have a lot of quantity, but the quality is starting to decrease substantially. Now, obviously, the ones that are supplemented, they achieved higher body condition score in November, right? The, or the orange and the green line. But no difference if I supplemented them for the entire late gestation period or just half. Now, after calving, whoever received pre calving supplementation was able to sustain greater uh, body condition score. So which treatment would you pick for your cows? Uh, the one that is just the first half, right? Reduce labor by half, achieve the same body condition score at calving. So when we look at pregnancy rates, we didn't see any differences in this study here. Why is that? Now, look at the control group, the ones that didn't receive supplementation, the blue line. Even though they lost condition, at the time of calving, they still had a body condition score above five. They started the study pretty good. And after calving, they lost less than half of a point. So that's exactly what we want our accounts to do, calve in good condition and lose less than half. So technically, we did not need the pre-calving supplementation at all. So that's why those cows didn't benefit from a small amount of supplementation. Now, but when we look at calving distribution, 
we see that those counts that received submitation during the first half of the legislation period, more counts kept during the first 30 days. So that's something that we really wanted, right? So total amount of calves are the same, but they're being born earlier. So they're gonna be older and heavier at the time of weaning. And they also, cows will have more time to recover before the next breeding season. So this is a highly desirable outcome. Might not have more calves, but they're gonna be older, give them more time to recover, right? So again, which treatment would you pick for those cows? Well, the one that is supplemented the first 42 days, right? Even though pregnancy rates didn't increase. Now, what happened to the calf performance? This is percentage of calves that were born alive and birth body weight. And regardless of the length of submutation period, those that were born from cows that received protein and energy supplement before calving, they were two to three pounds heavier at the time of birth. No difference between the, those two treatments. And this is something that people ask a lot of the times. If I supplement my cows, they're gonna be bigger. I say, Probably. Most of our studies in Florida, it's increasing birth weights by two to three pounds, but we're not changing the percentage of calves being born alive. So it has not been a problem with calving difficulty. That doesn't mean it couldn't be, right? So if you're already running problems with calving difficulty, you should, not, you should consider not doing it before calving, right? But if you're not, we're not seeing any problems as long as you remain with the amount of supplementation that we're providing, two to four pounds a day. Okay. Now, what about pre-weaning growth of those animals? So these are their body weights from all the way from two months all to nine months of age. And we weighing those calves at nine months. And as you would expect, those calves born from cows that received supplementation, they were heavier at weaning compared to those that did not receive pre-calving. About 15 to 30 pounds. But the best results were for the ones that were born from cows that were supplementing the entire late gestation. So it seems for the calf, we need a more consistent supplementation program to increase their performance. So the main, the key message for this study is that when we think about the cow, the best treatment for the cow was not necessarily the best treatment for the calf in terms of increasing weaning weights. And if you do the economics of this part, the only treatment that paid off was supplementing during the entire late gestation. So by trying to sacrifice labor, we decreased weaning weights by 30 pounds per calf. All right, just something to, for us to think about. And there are more studies that I'm gonna mention about this. Now, after weaning, we send those calves to the feedlot. We wanted to look at their health, their immune system, carcass quality and performance in the feedlot. We didn't see any differences in the, their stress response. So the first two data, cortisol and heptoglobin, is a way that we measure how stressful those, arms are, those animals are. And we didn't see any difference. But the main thing that we found was that the calves that are born from cows that receive supplementation, they respond better to the vaccination. More calves respond to the vaccine and they produce more antibodies. So in, technically, they are more protected against bovine respiratory disease at feedlot entry. And the best results were the ones that were born from cows that were supplemented during just, just the first half. So do you see the pattern for the cow, it was one treatment. For weaning weights, I needed to supplement for longer. But if I wanted to look at health or immune response, actually, it was another treatment. So depending on your goals, that's why I said, depending on what you need, we can shift the timing of supplementation. Now, what about carcass quality? The only difference that we found was that calves that are born from cows that receive supplementation, they had greater marbling scores and greater percentage of carcasses graining choice. And the, the best treatment are the ones that were supplemented during the first half. So again, every depending on your goal, we can decide a different strategy that we will use for those animals, all right? Now, having said that, in Florida, most of the producers, they sell the calves at the time of weaning. So weaning weights, it's their major source of income. So it seems that based on the first study that I showed you that we have to supplement them for a long time. So what we did in this study here is try to decrease the frequency of supplementation to enable people to supplement for 90 days and, and at the same time reduce labor, All right? So a very simple, yes. Uh, they're around six to seven years old. All the studies that I'm going to show you here, they're mature cows with seven, around six to seven years old. So in this study here, about 80 days before calving, we got a group of mature cows and we divided them in four treatments, right? No supplementation before calving or 14 pounds of distillers per cow per week, which was offered once on Monday, all 14 pounds in a single day, or divided by three and then offered Monday, Wednesdays, and Friday and then divided by seven and other offer daily, okay? 
the whole idea was how low can I go in frequency before hurting the performance of the cow and the calf. All right. Then after calving, we everybody's treated exactly the same, all the same pasture, same supplementation, all the way to weaning. So what we've seen is in terms of cow performance, body condition scored at the time of calving, whoever receives supplementation is heavier at the time of calving, right? Greater condition score, but no differences due to frequency. You can supplement them once a week and still achieve the same result as supplementing daily. I said, it's great, right? So for a producer, it works amazing. You can just go once a week and problem solve. Now, when we look at the calf performance, we got better results as we increase the frequency of supplementation. And the best, the heaviest calves were the ones born from cows that were supplemented daily. So there's a trade-off, right? And it seems that most of our studies, the cows handle very well. You can do a lot of things with them, like less frequent, changing the time, and they perform just fine. But when we look at the calves, it seems that we need a longer period and more consistent. Now, if you cannot do daily, do three times a week, it's still better than doing once. But uh, it, it's just a pattern that we see in all of our studies. Okay. Now, what about feed additives? And I'm going to show you only one study uh, just because of sake of time. So pre calving supplementation, you can provide protein and energy, right? But it's also a vehicle to add feed additives that could help boost the response to this type of supplementation. So one of the supplements, the feed additives we wanted to look was monensin. Right? Monensin is used a lot for growing calves. Uh, they control coccidiosis, and also they help, they change the pattern of ruminal fermentation and, and makes the animal more feed efficient, let's say, right? A very broad overview of monensin, okay? So what we wanted to do is be 70 days before calving, very simple design, no supplementation. Uh, a third of those cows received two pounds of distillers for 70 days before calving, and a third of them, two pounds of distillers added with this ionophore. After calving, everybody is the same. Everybody molested in urea, same pastures, nobody receiving monensin. Okay, so the only difference is, is that 70 days before calving. So in terms of cow performance, again, look at the control, that's the black line. The last 40 days of the study, they start losing condition score, right, and they continue losing body condition score after calving. But whoever receives supplementation is have a greater body condition score, but no differences due to monensin. So look at Kevin in November. Adding monensin didn't increase their body condition score at the time of Kevin. After Kevin, those cows that had received monensin, they were able to maintain greater body condition score. We don't know exactly what's going on, but it seems that there is a carryover effect on those animals uh, right after Kevin. But when you look at the pregnancy rates in this study here, don't know benefit of adding the monensin, but both of those groups had greater pregnancy rates than those that did not receive supplementation. Now, why in this study we had greater pre calf supplementation worked and the other two studies that I showed you didn't do anything? Because this study here now, they finally calved and the body condition score lower than five and they continue losing. All right, so then you can see a dramatic increase in pregnancy rates with just two pounds of supplement for 70 days. Now, what happened? So, which treatment would you pick? the one that has supplement without the monensin, right? Monensin costs three cents a day, three to four cents a day, very cheap. But still, why would I add that if it's not increasing the performance of the cows? But when you look at the calves, again, whoever receives supplementation is heavier at the time of weaning, but those that were born from cows that received monensin, they were 50 pounds heavier at weaning. So three cents a day for 70 days, that's $2. You get 50 pounds more. So we're still trying, we don't know exactly what's going on, right? What, what is the deal here? What is it the muscle, is it gene expression? We need to repeat this type of study to make sure that these, these responses are consistent and also try to understand what's going on. But the whole idea is just to show you that this is a very strategic time to use some of those types of supplementation that can help boost the, their performance. So just to summarize everything, just to give you a very clear idea of what we have seen, I put together all four studies, right? We have about seven, but I put four ones just to give you a very clear picture of what's going on. All of those studies done here in Florida. So you have study one, two, three, and four, the ones that are not supplementing and supplemented, okay? At the beginning of the study, you guys can see that no differences in body condition score. And most of the time, those cows are in excellent condition. So you would never think about supplementing those cows before calving. Plenty of grass, they are almost six in body condition score. Why would you do that? 
Now, when you look at body condition score at Kevin, in a lot of them, the control group, they lose condition, but they still manage to Kevin body condition score five, right? Except for that one last study that I just showed you, that they were slightly below. And that, and that was the only study that we see an increase in pregnancy rates. So most of the time, if they're in good condition at the beginning, right after weaning, they have in good condition, our studies are showing no benefit on count performance, except for when they have in a slightly lower condition score. But in all of those studies, one consistent response is that calves are 20, in average 20 to 24 pounds heavier if they were born from cows that received supplementation. And in two of those studies, the only two that we follow them all the way to slaughter, in both of them, we see a better response in terms of immune function, right? More calves responding to the vaccine, producing more antibodies when they enter the feedlot, right? Now, what about heifer? What happens to the heifers that you keep from those cows? So we didn't, we were not able to run these, these studies here in Ona, but I'm gonna show you what other folks have done in other locations in Florida, all right? So this table here, again, just to show you that, uh, the reproductive tract of these animals, they develop pretty much throughout the entire gestation, right? So there's all kinds of events happening during gestation in the ovaries and uterus, all the formation of that repro tract, right? But so it's not hard to imagine that by changing the nutrition during gestation, you're going to affect how these tissues and organs develop. So for example, this study here, it shows that heifers born from cows that did not receive supplementation, they had smaller ovaries and smaller CL when they reach puberty, I mean, by 12, 12 months of age. So unfortunately, they slaughter all the animals in this study, so we don't know how well they perform, right? But other studies that follow the productive performance of those animals, they seem like that a small supplementation of protein, about a pound a day during late gestation, they increased weaning weights of the heifers. In one of those studies, they achieved puberty sooner, although that seems to be just because they are heavier. Right? Not necessarily any other effect, but in another study, they increased pregnancy rates and the percentage of heifers calving during the first 21 days of their first calving season, which is something highly desirable, right? Heifers that calve during the first 21 days of their calving season, they have longer, uh, greater lifetime productivity. They win heavier calves for the next six years. They have greater pregnancy rates for the next six years and they stay longer in the herd. So this is something highly desirable. So with a very small investment on pre-calving supplementation, look at all the outcomes that they had to the heifers. Now, other studies follow up with this type of idea. So for example, this is a study done with angles and cemental cows that received or not distillers before calving. What they saw was that those that were born from cows that received the distillers, they were about 30 pounds heavier at the time of weaning, quite consistent to the other studies. However, after weaning, they didn't see any differences in average daily gain, no differences in puberty attainment, no differences in ovary classification, right? The amount of follicles in each of those ovaries, but they saw an, a substantial increase in pregnancy rates to AI. So even in studies that you do not have any effect on growth and puberty attainment, you're still having a benefit in pregnancy rates of those heifers. Another one, last one I'm gonna show you, okay? This, this one, they changed their diets for a much longer period. So they had a diet that provided only 75% of the energy, 100% or 125, right? So the first letter of each column is the diet that was provided in the second trimester. And the second word is the, is the diet that was provided in the third trimester of gestation, okay? And those are the four combinations that they had. So what they see in these studies, no differences in birth weights, Weaning weights, post weaning average daily gain, breeding body weight, nothing. Growth performance of those heifers in that study did not change at all. And maybe at the end, we can talk about why we have some of those inconsistencies. Also, no differences in puberty, uh, follicle counts, and even pregnancy rates. But what they discuss in this study here is that all the counts that were in excellent body condition score, even the control group that was providing energy deficient diet, they were around six, calved and up five and a half. So what they argue in this study is that the conditions of the cow were so good that the pre-calving supplementation probably, any effect that it was diluted didn't result. But even in this study, that the conditions are playing totally against 
using pre-calving supplementation, they saw an increase in calving percentage and the percentage of heifers calving early if they were born from cows that received supplementation that they nev never experienced any restriction during uh, mid second and third trimester. So even in this scenario that you shouldn't ever consider feeding those heifer, those cows during pre calving phase, uh, they're still seeing benefits to the project. All right. This is just an overview that I wanted to give you, right? Uh, and uh, I wanted to give a lot of time for those two guys to speak. But the main message that I want to show you is um, this is an opportunity for beef cattle producers. It seems that our cows here in our conditions, even though we have plenty of grass, they respond very well to this strategy. And we should consider that not just to increase body condition score, but also enhance the long-term performance of those animals. Now, obviously, there are some challenges. We know more that we don't know everything than what we were able to find out in those studies. So there's very, very few amount of data looking at Bosinicus influence. Cattle that has Bosinicus influence and how they respond. Uh, Texas and Florida are one of the few, and some folks in Australia are the few that are looking to that. And we know the animal that has Bosinicus influence, they behave differently in a several strategies. Also, very few studies looking at how the diet provided after birth determines if the diet provided before calving is going to work or not. The idea is that, for example, you might supplement those cows before calving, and you let's say you program those animals. But after calving, if you don't provide a good nutrition for those calves, they never express the differences that was programmed by birth. Right? I'm not going to extend much, but maybe at the end we can talk more about that. Okay? And also something to complicate the, the results. Sometimes calves, steer calves respond totally different to female calves. So you supplement the cow, you don't know which one is carrying a female or a male, and the response to the calf is totally different. But we need to do more studies on that. And also something that we really lack, and the dairy folks are way ahead of us in terms of research, is following those animals for several years, following those heifers for five, six years in the, into their productive life. And also did multiple generations. There are indications in dairy, for example, that heat stress during gestation affects how the daughters will perform and the granddaughters, even though they're managed in an environment that is not heat stress. So we and we that that type of data we still we unfortunately we don't have in beef cattle, but we're collecting here at some point. We, you guys are gonna hear about what we're doing 